talking about something like bark, like this looks nothing like paper. It's definitely not soft and malleable. So what we need to do is we have to cut this into tiny little pieces. And if you look over here, I've got these great big cooking kettles over here. So what we would do is we would pull one of those kettles down and we would cut this up into little pieces and boil it and cook it with some 
caustic acid, usually here, soda I've ash, I've got these and big when you're cooking about kettles over like here. So what like, we would do is we would pull one like of those kettles down, and we would cut this up into little pieces so and boil it and cook it with stuff. Earlier, I heard feedback whenever after you muted yourself, but I don't hear any feedback on my end. You're coming through crystal clear and everything. Yep. Earlier, I heard feedback whenever after you muted yourself, but I don't hear any feedback on my. It end. seems to be going well. Yeah. Gotcha. So are we taking it from the top or from where I left off? Why don't I introduce you? Yeah, we'll take it from the top and I'll just introduce you right now. Yeah. Oh, wait, we're still live. So I can just introduce you right now. Hi. <laughs> gotcha. So are we taking it from the top or from where I left off? But we're, gotcha. I think we're good now. Well, if you can't hear anything, yeah, we'll the then the audience probably can't hear right anything. Now. And then they'll... Yeah. Oh, wait, we're still live. Okay, gotcha. Well, right but now. they may not Time. have been able to hear the information. But <laughs> go ahead and ask. Are we taking it from the top or from where I left off? But we're, gotcha. I think we're good now. Well, if you can't hear yeah, anything, the then the audience probably can't hear right anything. Now. And then they'll. Yeah. Oh, wait, we're still if I do. Well, right but now. they may not Time. have been able to hear the information. But <laughs> go ahead and ask. Are we taking it from the top or from where I left off? But we're, gotcha. we're good now. Well, if you can't hear anything, then the audience probably can't hear anything. I, if I, do I just want to make a point of saying that if we were in an audience and I was writing this stuff down on big pieces of paper, we wouldn't be having these technical difficulties. I'm just saying. I just want to make a point of saying that if we were okay. in an all right. audience, we're going to start from the top. Writing this stuff down on pieces of paper, we wouldn't be oh, having right. technical difficulties. We're going to do this the whole thing again. We're going to start over. All Let's right. just start over. Hey, welcome to the Deeper Connection series, where we welcome a professional okay. artist right. into the actor community the to share their knowledge and backstory with our students. We Today, right. we're going to be talking with Daniel Colvin, a paper maker. Paper right. is an start integral over. part of hey, our society, and yet series, it is a product we use every day without much thought as to how it is made or how it is developed. Newspapers, books, toilet paper, clothing, and money all require paper. To do without paper would be a monumental task, even in today's digital world. So a little background information on our guest paper maker, Daniel Colvin. Daniel has a BFA in printmaking and papermaking from the prestigious Columbus College of Art and Design. He has over 20 years experience as a professional artist and teacher through Kobanik Studios, a book art studio in Columbus focusing on paper and book conservation. Let's take a trip to Kobanik and see what Daniel's up to. <laughs> Man. Again. All right. So, as Ben mentioned, I am a paper maker. And what we're going to do here today is go through what paper is where it comes from, its historical cultural significance, and you know just uh, how, how it's made. Uh, so let's just dive right in. So paper is made from plants. That's where it all starts is with plants. And that's why you know, you're able to take so many things and recycle them and make paper. So old paper can become new paper and a lot of your clothes and rags and whatnot can be turned into paper because they started out as cotton. 
So cotton will make your clothes and then clothes makes rags and rags makes paper. That's an old adage that paper makers have used for a long time. And with the, uh, one of the best examples of that is the money that you have. So when you accidentally wash a dollar and you pull it out later and you're like, oh, wow, it didn't hurt it at all. Because you're basically washing a, a piece of cloth because they've taken the cotton that is from your clothes and turns that into paper and it's just as tough as a piece of cloth most of the time. So, but how do you get from point A to point B? What are the dots in between? Well, that's a good question. Again, it all starts with plants and let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and start with cotton since we were talking about cotton. Now, some of you may or may not have ever seen a raw piece of cotton, but this is what cotton looks like when it comes out of the field. It's off colored, it's got seeds and oil in it, and this all has to be picked off and cleaned and then turned into either thread or clothing or, or even just paper pulp. But that really doesn't, it, it, even though cotton is used a lot, it doesn't really um, explain how tougher plants can get turned into paper. Because what it comes down to is how much strong string-like ropey fiber is in a plant. That's how you know whether or not you can use a plant for paper making or not. Because just because it's a plant doesn't mean you can use it. Like this is kozo bark from Japan. And I use this a lot in my own work. So this is a great paper making fiber. However, you probably wouldn't want to use lettuce or cactus, you know, and definitely not poison ivy. I get that all the time. So, but, you know, but those things are mostly water. They don't have a whole lot of fiber content to them. So now this doesn't look anything like paper, obviously. And it also is not soft and it's not malleable. So to get it to a state where we can use it, that's what these big pots over here are for. We've got these big cooking kettles up here. And what we do is we'll take those kettles and we pull them down and then I'll cut this into little pieces and put it into the boiling water and let it cook. And you know, we usually add a little bit of a caustic to it, like a mild caustic called soda ash. And you know, this whole process kind of stimulates uh, what happens in your mouth and your stomach whenever you cook food and eat it. So, you know, you're, you need to cook potatoes before you can bash them and you cook carrots to make them easier to chew. This is the same idea. So like, like the saliva and the stomach acids in your mouth and in your stomach, you know, those work the same as the acids and the soda ash to break down the fiber. And then it's cooked just like it would be in your stomach or you know, outside. And then it's mashed just like your teeth would be. But now a paper maker's teeth, to a certain extent, comes in the form of our beaters. So this is, for all intents and purposes, the mouth of my studio. We have two different kinds here. We've got a valley beater, um, and then we've got a Raina Hollander beater. Now, the Hollander beater um, is uh, basically a big, stainless steel tub that we fill with water and then we also fill it with pulp. And then these fly bar here um, are act as the upper teeth. And you can't see it, but below this turn wheel here, but below this turbine is a plate with grooves in it that acts like the bottom uh, teeth of our mouth. So these top teeth will grind against the bottom teeth, and then that is how the pulp is made once you put the pl cooked plant fiber into the vat. Now, what do we do with it after it's pulp? There's a bunch of stuff that we can do with it after it's pulp. One of the things that I like to do whenever I am working with uh, schools like yours um, is I will keep it really thick and chunky. So this is what pulp looks like once it's been ground up. And then this has had a little bit of a pigment added to it because most pulp, you know, when you, it'll come out as a natural fiber 
or it'll come out with the white of cotton. Um, that's one of the fun things about cotton is that as long as you keep it clean, it stays white. But that doesn't make for very interesting artwork. So whenever we go to uh, do stuff with the schools, we will have a whole bunch of buckets of concentrated pulp like that. It hasn't been diluted with water. And then, you know, we will sculpt with it. So if you look right over here, you can see a mural that we've made that has all those kind of different colors in it. So every color on here is a different color pulp that has been sculpted and layered to create a fun three-dimensional mural that can be installed somewhere permanently. Um, and uh, that's, that's one of the nice things about paper is it's pretty tough as long as you keep it dry and out of direct sunlight. Now, if you look back over here, um, the way that, the, the other way that paper makers will make paper is to dilute it. And that, that's the most traditional form of paper making. Whenever you think of paper, you think of the sheets, the flat sheets, the rattly sheets, the stuff you draw on, the stuff that's in books, you know, the stuff you put in your print, computer printer. All of this stuff is made basically the same way. And that's where you take a screen that's been stretched around a frame, and then you have a big vat full of water that the pulp has been added to to make it disperse and make it diluted. And then once it's dispersed and diluted, then you can capture it on that screen, press the water out, and then you have paper. So let's go ahead and check that process out. So what we have here is, this is my paper making vat. And I am going to put on my handy dandy rubber apron here because this is also a very wet process. It can be wet sometimes. So what we have here is a paper making vat. Now this vat is full of water and paper pulp. Now what I have here is what's called a paper maker's mold. And you can see that it's got wooden ribs running across it. It's got a couple different thicknesses of screen and it's pretty dense in the sense that you know, it allows you to really capture the paper pulp, even though it's ground up into tiny pieces and get it to form all together. Now, this is called the decal. Now, the decal goes on top of the mold in a way so that you can contain the pulp and be able to get the thickness of paper that you need. And then also give us nice crisp edges all the way around. And now, if we were going to be doing this in a school like yours, I wouldn't be dragging this great big huge thing around. People usually don't get to see this setup. When you guys, whenever I come to your school, I usually have little bins with small things. You guys are doing this on a much more simplified level. But hey, since we're here, you know, show you how, show you how fun it is to use the uh, big equipment, right? So the first thing you need to do, whether you're doing it at, um, in a smaller area or in a larger area is you've got to agitate the vat. You've got to get all that pulp that has settled to the bottom of the vat stirred up and mixed up so that when we pull our sheet, it's ready to go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a scooping motion. So what happens is you go almost straight down and then you skim it up and then you flip off a little extra and then there's a little bit of a shake and then a bounce and then you got a sheet of paper. So it sounds easy, but the paper maker shake, as they call it, is something that's really, really tricky. It takes a lot of practice and I've been doing it for a long time and I still can't pull a perfect sheet of paper every single time. So we're gonna go ahead and give that a try. So we're gonna go down, up, couple shakes. You can see that it has a nice, smooth, creamy kind of surface. And that's what we want for a sheet of paper. 
And then I'm going to rinse off my arms here. When you got, when you're a little furry like I am, you got to watch that pulp off. Otherwise, get that stuff drying in your arms. Not all that comfortable. So now this is, after this drains for a second, you're going to want to very carefully pull this off and get it out of the way without dripping anything onto the paper. Um, little drips or watermarks will happen every once in a while, and they call those paper makers tears, because what you've done then is you've taken a perfect piece of paper and made it not so perfect, because now there's a, a little round thin spot in it. So we're gonna pull that up, hang it up here out of the way. All right, and then I'm going to, oh, it got me anyway. So you see that right there? That little, I got a, I cried all over my paper. So it happens though, it happens. Normally I would remake that piece of paper, but since we're just demoing today, I'm not gonna worry about it. And now this part is called couching. And um, that is a French word that's spelled like the American word couch, but it's pronounced couch. And that is basically right now, all this pulp is on here via surface tension. Um, and uh, for any of you guys that know basic science, you know, there, there is a tension between a liquid and a solid capillary action. It holds it and, and, and sucks it on there. So what I need to do is with a little bit of, with a rolling motion and a little bit of pressure, I'm going to be able to break the surface tension and get this pulp off of the screen and onto the felt. So we're gonna roll it down, press on it, roll it back up, and then we have um, a piece of paper there. Now, you, you can see where it's a little bubbled and everything. That's pretty normal, and those bubbles will come out um, as I make more and more and more sheets of paper. Uh, so usually, you know, even though I've got a cushion underneath here to minimize that, that those bubbles usually uh, happen for the first couple sheets of paper. And then after that, after it gets really cushiony, um, then the rest of the post, you will be, you know, nice and flat and smooth. But like I said, once I take another felt and I just gently roll it down on top of it, all those bubbles will just go away with the final pressing. Now, once the, now normally I will make 20 sheets of paper at a time because that's how many pieces of paper my hydraulic press will hold. And if we spin right around here, I'm not gonna use the hydraulic press today because I don't have enough time with you guys to make 20 sheets of paper. But what would happen is I would put this board on top of the stack and then slide the whole thing in and then with the hydraulic press down here, just crank it up into where all the water would press out and go into this gutter and then down the drain and out of the way. Um, then once that's pressed, then we pull it out and it would come over here to the drying rack. I'm gonna take this off since I'm done with the messy part. And then we would come to the drying rack. Now, I have saved the um, drying rack for the last part because that's going to be, um, you know, the, the, the fun part is seeing the paper whenever it comes out. So I saved that to do with you guys. This is paper that I made a couple days ago. And so once we do this, now while I'm digging this out, I will, uh, I'll just tell you that um, paper, the, the, the way that paper came to be is fascinating because um, it, it was not invented as much as it was discovered. So paper was discovered by a noble of the Chinese um, court uh, about, you know, over 2000 years ago. And basically what happened is, you know, he through accident, he discovered that mulberry bark that has been softened and then beaten and manipulated and then allowed to dry creates this amazing malleable substance 
And so then he just started experimenting with it. And what he didn't realize was that he had basically stumbled onto a discovery that was going to change the entire way, way that the world operated. So, you know, and, and the funny thing about it is that paper existed in China for almost a thousand years before the rest of the world even knew that it existed. Because it first left China through India, where it was once trade opened up in India, and then from India, it made it to Europe. And then uh, from Europe, it then expanded and then eventually came to the United States with colonization. But, it, but you know, it was, you know, almost 1,200 years before Europeans got their hands on paper. Um, and even longer than that before it made it to Africa. So the, the, the reason I'm saying all that is because there are things that I'll show you here in a second that are called proto-papers. So uh, people say paper, but then they're thinking of papyrus. Well, papyrus is a little bit different because in Egypt, they would take the papyrus reeds, which were about this big around, they would peel the husk off, and then they would slice it into thin pieces, weave it together like a basket, crush it together, polish it, and then that would become papyrus. And I have an example over that in a second I'll show you. Um, and then also, uh, they also had uh, animal skins, which is vellum and uh, uh, parchment. So parchment and vellum are actually animal skins. And the reason that these things are called proto papers is because these are basically paper substitutes that were used because nobody knew that paper existed yet. And because in order for it to truly be paper, it has to follow the process that I showed you guys a little bit ago. It has to be a plant and it has to be a plant that has been cooked and destroyed and that it has to be put back together and formed and then the water is pressed out and then it's dried. And then once it's dried, we end up with something that will look like this, which is a freshly formed, brand new, crispy sheet of paper. Now, one of the things that I like to do with the paper that I make is books. I make a lot of books. Um, and, but, but before we go to the book studio and before we move on to that, I want to backtrack just a little bit because I remembered that I forgot to tell you about some of the fun science stuff that I promised. So, um, so, uh, so I mean, like, so now this is the papyrus that I was telling you about. You can see how it is um, layers that have been woven together and then they just press it underneath great weight and it's shiny because then they polish it. So, but this is not paper because you can see the individual fibers. Even, even though it, it kind of works like paper and it rattles like paper, this is not considered paper. Um, it comes from the weaving of the papyrus plant. And now what I wanted to go back to is this. Some of the fun science stuff is getting the color into the pulp. Getting the color into the pulp is a lot of fun. If you look up here, you can see I have a whole basically palette of colors that are up here. And so with the colors that are up here, these are all liquid pigments. And pigments are basically ground minerals that are then floated in a binder, and then you can add it to different things. So with these pigments, you know, I can make the pulp. But the, the funny thing about pigments and pulp is that they share um, physically, they share the same magnetic charge. Um, I'm assuming that you guys have all had enough science to know that everything in the universe has some form of electrical magnetic charge, whether it's positive or negative. Well, the thing with these is that they both have the same electronic charge. So if I was to just take a big handful of pulp and then take some of this and squirt it on it and then squeeze it out the water, the pulp would stay white and all of the pigment would just come right out because this doesn't operate the same way as paint does. Um, it, 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 it'll stain a little bit, but it doesn't hold color the way that this is. So what we have to do is we have to add a chemical that is called a retention aid. Um, and that basically changes the molecular structure of the pulp so that the pulp then becomes positive 
and the pigment stays negative. So then that way, whenever I take the pigment and add it to the pulp, it binds together. And no matter how much water I squeeze out of this or how long it's, you know, how old it is, because I think this mural is um, eight years old now. Uh, we, we made this in 2011. And so that is, you know, a, so, and it's just as bright as the day we made it because of the way that the pigments are clinging to the pulp. So now before we go downstairs and check out the uh, book studio, there's one last thing I want to talk about as flow while we're in the paper studio, which is uh, my own personal artwork outside of the uh, books. Now, because like I like playing around with different fibers. I mentioned earlier that a lot of what I use in my own work is the, um, is the Kozo. Well, when Kozo is beaten and turned into paper, it looks something like this. So this is what Kozo paper looks like. Now, what I like to do with my artwork is I like to combine different, um, different pigmented resins. So this and this are the exact, exact same piece of paper. The only difference is that this is the raw paper that has not been manipulated. And then this shell that I have created um, for the sculptures that I make has been, you, has been um, manipulated with uh, pigmented resin. So I will take resin and over, over five or six or seven coats, slowly build up different colors to make it. And then I usually suspend them on these laser cutout uh, uh, acrylic pieces, which could be cool. So if you are so inclined, and you want to go to my website, tobinicstudios.com. You can see pictures of what these look like installed. Because they tend to be larger installations, I'm not able to keep them just up and around like other painters or other you know, artists are able to. So it's kind of hard to show you the whole artwork. But if you go to the website, you can see pictures of what it looks like when it's installed on a wall at a gallery. And then this guy too. This is a, the same, same idea, same process, but a different sculpture. Um, these were two different sculptures in the same series. And this one had this shape of acrylic piece whenever it was installed. So both of them are a lot of fun. So now we are going to go ahead and head down to the book studio. But before we head down there, this is the first step of making a book after we've made the paper. So what I do is I take a stack of paper that's come out of my drying rack and I bring it over here to my paper guillotine. And this is a paper guillotine that will cut several, several sheets of paper at a time. I also use it to trim the books after I have sewn them together, but before we put the covers on. So this is too big to go down into the downstairs studio. So that's why we leave it up here to use and why I wanted to show it to you, because not only is that a good segue into the book binding, but this is also technically the first step of book binding, cutting all the paper down to size. So um, yeah, did you, wanna, did you wanna transition out then? How did you wanna do that? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, if you want to kind of walk down to, um, yeah, the uh, the next step of your presentation, as you're walking down there, I'll uh, catch everybody up who's new uh, or maybe just have tuned in. Uh, so we are with Daniel Colvin, uh, who is a paper maker. Um, and something interesting that he wrote to me a couple of weeks ago as we were planning this out and scheduling this um, and he wrote that paper is an integral part of our society, and yet it is a product we use every day without much thought as to how it is made or how it is developed. And I think that even just over the last, what, 25 minutes, uh, really getting able to kind of see that process um, from nothing or like from tree to paper um, is really interesting. I've honestly never. Uh, taking the time to dive in to understand how paper is made. I've always just heard that it comes from trees and somebody clicks their fingers and it's magically created. And so thank you, Daniel, for kind of 
walking us through that process. I definitely have a couple of questions that I am excited to ask Daniel. Um, and we will be having a question and answer session um, after this next part um, of Daniel's presentation. So if you've got any questions, um, feel free to drop those in the Facebook comment section and we will relay those to Daniel. Um, Cause there's a lot of interesting, yeah, a lot of very interesting um, kind of components of, you know, paper is one of those things that we, that we, again, we deal with every day um, and we use it so much. And to think that, you know, it's just, I, lo I love exploring and diving deep into those things that I never really, or that I take for granted. And I never really think about how they are created, how they are made. Um, so again, we're super thankful to have uh, Daniel here and he's showing us. And again, he's coming at, at us from his studio at Kobanik Studios. Um, it looks like Daniel is still making his way downstairs. I hope we didn't lose like his internet connection. Um, I'm ready. I was just waiting for for a, a place. Oh, to do here. you have a? Are you are you? Is this a piece of paper that you're showing on your screen? Oh no 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 no! no, no. We were just uh, we were the, 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 we just used it as a transition. To, I love it. Yeah, I love it. So there we well, go. Good. Well, good. Right. Uh, yeah, take it away. So here we are. All right, guys. So after paper is made, then it comes here. And uh, this is the uh, book bindery. So as you can see here, I have, um, I have several sheets of paper that are prepped and ready for us to be able to start the paper making uh, the, or, or the book binding process rather. Um, so it'll start with this size. And then what happens is we will usually fold it in half once and then tear it. And then we will fold it in half again to start making the book. And then once we have that together, then we will we will take that folded paper. And usually at this point, I would have you know I will have this sewn together in some capacity. Um, this isn't sewn because. I, depending on the kind of book you're going to make, you sew it in many different ways. So this has been uh, trimmed and prepared to be sewn into a, uh, a certain style of book, and it has been trimmed down to meet the size of the book boards that are going to go on it. And this is another version of the same kind of preparation. You can see that this one has been sewn and then it's got a little bit of paper here to cover up the string. And then this is also prepared for a certain style of book binding cover. And the covers are where it gets fun as well. You can see I've got all kinds of leather and I have all kinds of uh, book cloth and different things to play around with. In all of my flat files here, I have all kinds of decorative papers and recycled papers and um, antique papers. And usually what happens is once we have a book that has been sewn and the cover has been put on, and you can see here, this is a good example of a combination of our uh, recycled antique papers and leather. This is called a long stitch because you can see the stitching that's going through the back of the cover and the paper is sewn directly into the spine of the leather. And But not only do we have leather, but we also have um, this antique uh, uh, sheet music that, that we had gotten a box of. And I think this one, um, you know, it's not marked. We, you, we usually would put a, uh, uh, we would usually write like what the sheet music came from. I think this batch came from like Beethoven, Beethoven's like Fifth Symphony or something. Sometimes people really enjoy knowing that. And then, you know, then we have other books that are, um, that are just all leather. And this is the same kind of long stitch. And this one is called a Coptic stitch to where there is no spine, but there is the, you can still see the sewing but it's just two independent covers. 
And this one is from a recycled map of Paris. So if anybody enjoys Paris, we have a, we have a Paris book over here. And then we also like to make sure that we're ecological and we try to use up all of our scrap. So we'll make teeny tiny little companion books that you can have. The, the, so we use up all of our leather scraps and all of our paper scraps. Um, and then anything that's too small for paper to use, we just throw it back into the beater and make more paper. And this is our hometown book. So this is all, you know, this is all of our paper that's been cut out and collaged and we make a bunch of Ohio books too. And then, so this is also a Coptic stitch book. It's got our handmade paper on the inside. All of our paper is on the inside of these is all the paper that we make in the studio. And so you can see that, you know, the books will, so we'll tear the paper, we'll fold the paper, we'll sew it. And then after we sew it, then we get the covers onto it. And then it goes into this, which is called our nipping press. And then you put it into the press and then you, you just go all the way down and then you let that sit for a while. And so depending on how many books you're doing at a time, you know, that's how many books will go into the nipping press. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably the shortest, easiest explanation of, uh, of book binding. Everything else gets kind of like drawn out and technical. But as a paper maker, that's what I do. It's like I, 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 uh, we take all the paper that I make, take all the pulp that I make upstairs, and I either turn it into sheets of paper that I will use myself for books or myself as a printmaker and sometimes for my own drawings. Um, uh, other artists will use my paper for uh, drawings and printmaking, um, or we, you know, turn them into, uh, or I'll take the raw pulp and make the sculptures or the murals that we see when we, you know, go out into the community or schools like yours. So that's pretty much it, I think. So it's amazing. I don't know. Thank, yeah, no, thank you, Daniel. That's I. Yeah. I don't know if you heard as you were walking down uh, from upstairs, but I was talking about, yeah, it's just yeah, amazing. Yeah, I heard everything learn. you said. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's amazing to, to learn just, uh, you know, the actual process. Um, sure. So I'm actually, I'm super, super curious, and I'm going to kick off our question and answer session with this. Sure. Um, so I think about, like, at, at ACPA, we'll have a paper delivery of, like, probably tens of thousands of pieces of paper sure so, like what is the difference between like the mass production of paper and the paper you know i'm assuming that you're not a mass production company <laughs> or are you oh, no well no not no i mean not in the way that a factory like mead paper factory or something like that is like down in chillicothe the the the, the big the um the only difference really between what we're doing and what they do in the paper factory is um, is the uh, the only difference the the only thing that happens um, the, the only difference there is uh, we do um, small batches like I said and we use basically any kind of plant that there is um, the paper factories will use wood. Uh, is that, that's, that's the big difference is they use wood and they have the large machines and the large factories and the large conveyor belts and everything else that goes along with like making, uh, uh, you know, paper in, uh, in large, large quantities. So it's like, where, whereas we make stuff just kind of like one sheet at a time, they're making huge rolls of paper at a time that are just coming off of this conveyor belt and then just getting rolled onto a roll. And then it goes to the cutters. Or, or the printers, like in, like in, in the way of um, uh, notebooks, you know, they'll, it, it'll, the roll will go through a machine to print all the lines, and then it'll go into another machine that punches all the holes and goes into another machine that, you know, uh, cuts all the, cuts it all down to size and whatnot. Um, so, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, but, but the, the basic process is the, the same. It's, it's, you know, it's dispersing the pulp in water and then catching it and um, and then pressing the water out and letting it dry. 
Um, the, the, the only difference, you know, again, between us and factories is that they just do it on a much larger, larger scale, and they tend to use exclusively pine trees. So, I mean, that's why paper fa uh, factories, you know, have, uh, have, have, uh, have such a large, you know, forest demand. I mean, and, uh, and so, yeah, that's, and it's interesting because it, I mean, also watching that beginning, the beginning of your presentation makes me realize how important it is to recycle paper because it seems like it's a pretty easy process to take paper that has been used and put it back into being another piece of paper, right? Oh, yeah, it's an incredibly easy process. I mean, and that's one of the few things that is, um, that's one of the few things that's actually guaranteed to be recycled. Um, if you, you know, recycle it, like cardboard and paper will go somewhere that will get recycled. Um, like th there are other things that we put into the recycling that depending on what it is, um, you know, it, it, it may or may not make it, you know, to a recycling, you know, facility. But, you know, paper is one of those things that's always going to be, you know, re recycled. So, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. I've got a question too about is it, you call it a studio where you're at or? Uh, yes. Yeah. So did you build that studio? Did you create that studio? Yes, actually, um, my, uh, my wife and I, uh, a few years ago, uh, cause she, she's an artist as well. She's a collage artist with paper. Um, and we purchased a house, uh, specifically with, with, with the intention of converting the majority of it to, uh, creative spaces. Um, just to, to save money because uh, the, like renting commercial spaces for, uh, for for someone like me with everything that I need has just been you know really expensive over the years and so like where we were just at in the paper studio um, that was a that was the two car garage of the house which I retrofitted and you know converted. Uh, with electricity and plumbing and drainage to turn into a paper studio. And where we are now is um, our uh, basement. And so uh, th this portion of the basement here is my book bindery. And then there's another portion of the basement that's also a print studio. So how did you get into this? Um, I, um, it started out as a, a curiosity thing uh, whenever I was in high school. Um, a friend of my dad's was an artist, um, and she made paper on a very, very small, you know, basic scale. She just kind of did like the, the, the paper and the blender and, you know, and, and the whole process was just kind of fascinating to me. Um, and then, uh, as, and then once I got to CCAD, um, you know, the, the knowledge that the art form existed was already in my head. And then once I decided to go into printmaking, it kind of got re, uh, uh, re reconstituted, I guess, for lack of, I mean, it, it, it kind of sparked that interest again, uh, uh, you know, because as a printmaker, my, my main medium is paper. So, so uh, once I started getting heavily into printmaking, then I started to also get heavily into paper making because CCAD luckily at the time had a paper making program as an extension of their printmaking program. And so I was able to spend, um, you know, a, a, a good amount of time like developing my own papers to go with the, the, the prints that I was developing at the same time. I mean, there seemed, it would seem to me that there would be a lot more meaning behind a piece of art. You know, most artists, they grab piece of paper and then they draw on it but you kind of take it the next step and like I'm making my paper <laughs> and then I'm going to create yeah. with it well that's that's because I mean like um printmaking is very very process oriented um and there's a lot of detail and a lot of factors that you need to control and um the the paper that you use for the type of printmaking that you're doing is is one of those big factors and so for me i found it was able for me to it was it was um it was really easy for me to control the results of the kind of prints that i wanted to make if i was making the paper myself you know plus the fact that it was it was just economical i mean like i could make you know a ton of paper uh myself for the uh 
for for the cost for a fraction of the cost of what it would have taken me to purchase you know all of the paper that I needed and now no that, that isn't to say that I didn't you know purchase any like I, I did also purchase my fair share of paper because there were also some kinds of prints that just didn't lend itself well to you know what I was trying to do so yeah yeah awesome you had also mentioned that you want to push the limits of paper application right uh so i and you talked a little bit about that what is what are some really like radical ideas with that um some really radical ideas i think that um what i do um i think that what i do with my sculptures is pretty radical personally um and, and again, I mean, it's kind of hard to appreciate it in its individual components. Um, and, but, you know, if you were to, uh, you know, I, but I haven't seen a whole lot of people kind of, you know, manipulating the paper casting process the way that I have, and then also kind of suspending them the way that I have with the uh, use of the um, laser cut acrylic, you know, because for me, the whole idea is to take, you know, these very um, fragile kind of ethereal forms and create an atmosphere with them and around them so that once, you know, so that, so from afar, you know, um, you really can't, you know, tell that they're attached to the, to the wall because of the clear acrylic. I mean, they, they look kind of like they're floating to a certain extent. Um, the, the only thing that really gives them away is, you know, the shadows that are cast, but then even that has been planned out because I, you know, uh, cut the, the, the shapes into a certain shape and then I layer them and light them in a certain way so that, you know, not only do you have the translucency of the sculpture of the paper itself, but you also have the translucency um, of the uh, sh overlapping shadows and the shapes and the positive and negative spaces that are created, you know, within the sculpture itself. Um, now, another thing, and if um, I'm gonna have my, my, my camera lady just stay right there, I'm gonna go off camera for just a second. Another thing that I have done in the past that's kind of fun is, um, are um, sculpted, sculpted three-dimensional um, prints. So this is, so these are actually copper etching intaglio plates um, that have been enhanced with a little bit of watercolor um, that, uh, that, 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 are, that are also on sculpted paper. So, um, so, I mean, you could see all the line work and everything of the copper etching and then the, and then, you know, this is just on a, you know, molded sculpted piece of handmade paper. So, I mean, that's something that I was, that was actually kind of a, a transitional point of going into the current sculptures that I have now. Um, I kind of scaled back on the, uh, the, the, the printmaking element of it as I decided that, you know, that element of it really wasn't as, um, you know, important to me as what I discovered with uh, the, the, the manipulation of the paper and the watercolor itself, building up these intricate kind of, you know, layers, so. That's awesome. I think we've got a time for a couple more questions. If anybody's still watching live and you got a question for Daniel, feel free to drop it in the comment box. If I haven't um, bored everybody and scared yeah. them off. No, yeah, not yet. <laughs> do you watch do you watch the office do i watch office um yeah it, it, yeah we're we're both fans of that show both the Limit. original british like the, the, the original british one with uh, uh ricky gervais is, is super do they too. sell does that office also sell paper it it uh, it does <laughs> yeah i i only i'm really only familiar with the uh with the american version and i always i always laugh and like you know their phrase limit, limitless paper in a paperless right. world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, like, right, right. I mean, do you obviously? I think that you've already shown so many applications of paper beyond just writing stuff down. Right. Like, do you believe well, that paper is never going away? Well, I mean, the 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 joke I use is that I'm so obsolete that I'm cool again. So <laughs> um, it's uh, uh, it's it, it's just one of those things to where. 
you know, I mean, I don't know if it'll ever truly go away um, as long as the knowledge sticks around. I mean, I think it's one of those um, critical technologies, critical base technologies that the the information needs to stay, you know, just like carpentry or bricklaying or baking bread or any of these other things, because I mean, uh, the, the, the world's crazy and we've had enough uh, we've, we've we've had enough world disasters and and world wars and all these other things to kind of prove that you really you know you you really don't know what the future holds and if it all comes crashing down around us you know um, you know we we want to make sure that we're not I mean some of this stuff needs to be maintained in our brain and in our a society and in our culture and in our um, mouth to mouth to person oratory kind of like passing things of down because I mean if we get to the point to where like our um, our uh, 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 oh what was it if we get complacent enough and so dependent on technology that nobody retains information anymore the only thing that you're going like you just automatically look oh well i'll just google it well if the world blows up tomorrow and there's no more internet and there's no more google what do you actually know how to do by yourself you know what do you know how to do without having to go to google and look it up and if the world had to start over tomorrow like what would you be able to do with your own knowledge to survive um, and, and I'm not saying that everybody has to be responsible for that, but I think that the more people who are, you know, keeping that kind of thing in mind, you know, those are going to be the leaders of the future. Those are going to be the people, you know, that are going to be, you know, depending on, you know, uh, other people are going to be depending on them for that information. Like even, even if you're not, you know, the, the, the leader in the forefront, you're at least going to be a leader in the background because you have the knowledge, you know, and knowledge is power. And, and people that think that, um, you know, access to knowledge is power. Like, no, that's not the same thing, you know, cause you can, you can have access to Google and then know something, but if Google goes away, like what do you really know you know absolutely um wow yeah you kind of hit the nail on the head there <laughs> i mean it really is true i mean like uh yeah thanks daniel for being here i think we our might all get up. replaced by robots in six months Who knows? <laughs> but there will still be paper yeah right maybe <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe all right well uh that's all the time we got today uh um, thanks again, Daniel, for showing us around your studio, taking the time to, to enlighten us about the world of paper. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. This has been a, another episode of the Deeper Connection series. Uh, we are going to be taking a break tomorrow. We typically do our Friday afternoon live sessions. Um, but we are still figuring out the kinks of this super remote broadcast. So we decided to give the teachers that were scheduled to be on Friday afternoon live a break tomorrow. Um, but we will be back on Monday with another Deeper Connection series. Everybody have a great day. Have a great Friday. Have a good weekend and recycle your paper. See ya.